words of power because we are kings and our words matter. To enjoy God's best in this life, you need to hear, you need to consider. If this is the truth, you need to embrace it, you need to believe it, you need to confess it, you need to put it in your heart. You need to really believe it and determine to walk in the blessings of God. That's the way it's going to happen. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm to the fiercest ground and stone. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. When striving sees my comfort, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone. Turn with me to Philippians chapter 3 and let me read to you verse 20. For our citizenship is in heaven from which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body. This body is called a lowly body, not because this body is unimportant and God doesn't care about this body. After all, God has paid a price for this body, bought this body with a price. Then why is it called a lowly body? It is called a lowly body because it has been subject to death now because of sin that has entered into the world. It's called a lowly body compared to the glorious body that will be given later on. So, he says, who will transform our lowly body that it may be conformed to his glorious body, his glorious body. When Jesus rose from the dead, whatever kind of body he had, that is the kind of body that we will have one of these days according to the working by which he's able even to subdue all things to himself. So there comes a day when God is going to claim everybody, even when you die and go to the grave and go dust to dust and ashes to ashes, 
some people think that's the end is that's why when you you know when when you take the body to the grave to bury people get really worried and the crying starts very uh, you know they start crying too much there because sometimes i think they don't understand what's happening because they think this is the end the grave is the end we have come to the end this is it you come and throw this body in there and you forget it and it goes dust to dust and ashes to ashes but it's not so the bible says that god will come one day the trumpet will sound the archangel with the so with the shout of an archangel jesus will descend and they that are dead in christ will rise first all the graves will be opened and every body that has gone dust to dust and ashes to ashes will be claimed back from this earth by god just imagine that the owner is coming because that's his that's not yours that's his he won't leave it He told you to leave it there because you can't keep it at home after it's dead. He told you to take it there and leave it there. He said, "Don't worry, I'll come and get it." <laughs> Read the Bible right. He said, "I'll come and get it. I will claim it wherever it is if it is dead in the sea when animal ate it, no matter where the I know every molecule where it is, I will come and get it one of these days. That body I will claim it. And I will make it into a glorious body, the way that it is meant to be always." and i will give that body honor that it belong that that it that deserves as the temple of god i will make that vile body this weak body into a glorious body and claim it for myself so that man may once again in spirit soul and body will ever forever serve god and live with god so god has a great plan for the body so don't think of the body as an ordinary thing that is why while you're in here while you're in her in this earth you must believe for health and healing God needs your body it belongs to the Lord you must believe to live well live healthy that is why when Jesus came he went around healing why because it is not God's will for people to be sick he revealed that he never made anybody sick he healed everyone that came to him that's what the bible says just read the bible that is why when he finished his ministry when he went back to the father he said you go everywhere preach the gospel in may in my name you cast out devils in my name you lay hands on the sick and the sick will recover he has not forgotten the sick he didn't say forget about the sick let them die there let them come to heaven i'll take care of their body forget about it let them die and go to the grave i'll come and claim it and then i'll make everything no 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 he said no no, no i want them to be well he said go lay hands on the sick and they will recover god is interested in recovery so that even after jesus left and went up into heaven people were going out and they were praying for the sick and they were recovering you see the apostles doing the healing ministry of jesus the ministry of jesus never came to an end because that is the will of god it is part and parcel of the redemptive work of christ it is part and parcel of god's will for us so when we speak the gospel the gospel involves healing also under the old testament there was so much healing why shouldn't there be healing in the new covenant because the new covenant is a better covenant the better covenant you mean to say doesn't have those things that the that the lesser covenant had the better covenant should have more healing if anything so believe in healing believe to be well believe that it is god's will to be well believe that it is part and parcel of the gospel along with the gospel proclamation you see in the book of acts wherever the apostles went and preached the gospel they preached healing to the sick in their bodies they heal the sick also hello are you there because god is concerned about our bodies If you're sick today, believe to be healed. Believe the word of God. Believe the promises of God. Believe in the cross of Jesus where he took not only your sins but also your sicknesses and carried it there for you. All right. So the gospel that is why he said Jesus said gospel to the poor. He said I've anointed to preach the gospel to the poor. Then he said to heal the broken hearted, talking about the mental emotional problems and provide recovery of sight to the blind. and to heal all that were oppressed or deliver all that were oppressed he says so he's talking about oppression he was talking about healing the blind he was talking about uh, uh, reco- uh, uh, he was talking about uh, gospel to the poor he's talking about the broken hearted you see 
Jesus is concerned about our spirit, soul and body. He went to the cross in spirit, soul and body and died there in that way on the cross of Calvary. So believe that. All right. Now let's go to the material side of things because this, this material side of things is where, is where a lot of people have a problem. They say the gospel does not include that. They say one of the accusations they have is this. That it is mainly an Old Testament thing. Prosperity is mainly an Old Testament thing. In the New Testament, you didn't, don't read much about it. That's what they say. But I will show you that the gospel is part and the, the prosperity, material prosperity is part and part of the gospel. Turn with me to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews verse 1. Therefore, since a promise remains of entering his rest, let us fear lest any of you seem to have come short of it. For indeed, the gospel was preached to us. As well as to them. He's writing to New Testament Christians. And he says the gospel was preached to us as well as to them. In other words he says the same gospel that we hear today. Was also preached to the people of the old covenant. To them refers to the old covenant people. But the word which they heard did not profit them. Not being mixed with faith in those who heard it. In other words, if you read the context in the whole surrounding scriptures, he is talking about the people of Israel who came from the bondage in Egypt. That generation that came out of Israel under the leadership of Moses. He's talking about them. How that the gospel was preached to them. The same gospel that we hear was preached to them, he says. Amazing. The gospel was preached to us as well as to them. But the word which was preached to them... The word which they heard did not profit them. Everybody said did not profit them. Is it possible that you can hear something and not profit by it? You heard it but didn't profit? He says they, it was preached to them but they did not profit. Why? He gives the reason. Because they did not mix it with faith. They did not mix faith with it. That means when they heard it, they did not become willing in their heart and mind to accept it. They did not have the willingness to embrace it. They did not go after it. They did not love it. When the good news was declared to them, they did not receive it. They did not accept it. They did not with joy receive it and walk in it. They did not put their faith in it. So even though they heard it, it became unprofitable. They did not profit anything. Now, what was the gospel that was preached to them? He says the same gospel that was preached to us was preached to them. What is the gospel? Turn to me, turn with me to Exodus chapter 3. And let me read to you verse 7 and 8. Remember it's talking about the people of Israel who lived in slavery that were led out of it by Moses. How they heard the gospel. What was the gospel they heard? Look at verse 7. The Lord said, I've surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows. God says I've seen their cry. I know their sorrows. I know their condition. They're troubled. They're slaves. They're beaten. They're not given proper salary. They're not given food. They're not, you know, they're mistreated. I see their sorrows. I see their cry. They're literally crying out for deliverance. The oppressor is a big power. Egypt. The greatest power in the world at that time. These are a small people. They're crying out to God. And uh, crying out in sorrow and sadness. God says, I've heard it. But he didn't sit there and sing his blues. About how he heard their sorrows. Look at what he did. Verse 8. He says, so I have come down. That's the way to answer the cry. He says, I've come down. To de deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And to bring them up from the land. To a good and large land. To a land flowing with milk and honey. I want to stop right there. He says, I've heard their cry. They're in slavery. They're in bondage. This is a total picture of how God's deliverance, come, deliverance comes. It's a picture of salvation. God says, I've heard their cry. I've come down to deliver them. What is he going to come? What is, what is he going to do when he comes? Just deliver them and set them loose and set them, let them go and just struggle again? Not just to set them loose from their slavery. He says, I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of Egyptians, but the job is not over. Look at the total gospel. To deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up to a land, to a good and a large land. Everybody say to a good and a large land. 
flowing with milk and honey. Not to a good and a large land where milk is sold cheap and honey you can get cheap. Where milk and honey is available in plenty. No, he says, I'm going to bring them to a large and a good land where milk and honey will be flowing like a river. They are totally slaves. They are having half stomach full. Not getting proper salary. Beaten. Living under slavery. He says, I want to totally change their destiny. Not just loose their chains of bondage and deliver them out of slavery, but I want to totally make a change so that out of slavery they'll come and they live in total abundance where milk and honey is flowing. Hello. That's the gospel. The gospel is not just to bring a person out of the bondage of sin and Satan. The Egyptian bondage is the picture of the bondage to sin and Satan these days. That's the picture. So salvation, God hears our cry. God wants to save us. How does he save us? What is the salvation that, is, that he has provided through Jesus Christ? It is not a salvation where he loosed us just from the chains of sin and Satan. If he did lose us from sin and Satan, that's good. Maybe a lot of people will appreciate that and that's good enough, you think. But for God, it's not good enough. He says, I want to lose them from the chain of that bondage, deliver them, but then I've got to not stop there. The job is not over after I deliver them. I want to bring them to a good and a large land where it flows and with milk and honey. Total change of destiny from slavery, lack and want and poverty to abundance flowing with milk and honey. Good and a large land where nothing is missing, nothing is broken. That's the essence of the gospel. Hello, are you there? That's the gospel. Don't miss the picture, my friend. The gospel is not just a deliverance from sin and Satan. If you're delivered from your sin, wonderful. If you're delivered, forgiven of your sins, washed from your sins, made whole, delivered from the bondage of Satan, praise God for it. That's wonderful. But the gospel doesn't stop with that. God doesn't stop with that because God wants to give much more of that. That is what... Is, that is what we read in Isaiah 1, 18 and 19. He says, come, no matter how great your sin is, I'll wash you and make you white as snow. But then the job is not over. Then he says, if you become willing and obedient, then you will eat the good of the land. He doesn't want you to just be cleansed of your sins and made whole. He wants you to come and eat the good, the best of the land. His job is not over. He doesn't see it as finished until he leads you into the place of abundance and plenty and prosperity. Hello. How many of you see it like I'm seeing it? I feel like I'm going to take off. I feel so happy about it. God has got a total package. He says, I want to deliver them, but then I want to bring them to a totally different place. I want to deliver them, but my job is not over. Salvation is not over by just delivering them from sin and Satan. But I want to bring them to a good and a large land flowing with milk and honey. Total change of fortunes. Total lack on this side. Total abundance on the other side. I want to totally change it. You see, you got to understand that the blessings of God doesn't come automatically. That is why it says in Hebrews that they heard the gospel, but they did not profit. Why? Blessings don't happen automatically. You got to believe it. Embrace it. They heard it and did not profit. A lot of people are hearing the gospel, but because they don't embrace it. See, I've preached it so much to so many people. You know, so many people I know, you know, uh, you know when I started preaching, so many people rejected it. They rejected it. They laughed at it. They ridiculed it. They thought this was something new. They thought this was something strange. That this, they thought this was something unacceptable. That's what it's talking about. They heard the gospel preached, but it did not, did not profit them because they did not mix it with faith. Not everyone that heard my preaching profited from it because some laughed at it, some ridiculed it, some disbelieved it, some did not want to believe it, some believed that this is a heresy, some rejected it, some did not embrace it, some did not receive it with joy, some did not accept it, some did not go after it, some did not embrace it with all their heart. They did not become willing and obedient. That's why they did not enjoy it. See, salvation, healing, prosperity and all of this will become ours. Only 
when we embrace it when we embrace the good news when we receive it by faith the gospel is preached but it will not profit if we do not receive it with faith if you do not mix with faith and receive it with faith if you allow human tradition to hinder you from accepting it then you will miss out the best of the land you will never be able to eat the best of the land you'll die and go to heaven but you'll never be able to enjoy god's best in this life to enjoy god's best in this life you need to hear you need to consider if this is the truth you need to embrace it you need to believe it you need to confess it you need to put it in your heart you need to really believe it and determine to walk in the blessings of god that's the way it's going to happen read with me well, let's go to another passage so this is the essence of the gospel that's how it starts this is the gospel that was preached to them what do you think moses preached when he went and told them about what god told him there this is the opening of the gospel when moses went he said this is what god told me he's going to deliver us from the egyptian bondage take us into a good and large land flowing with milk and honey that's what he preached to the people what did moses preach he was a preacher of this gospel that included total prosperity and well-being amen all right let's go on a little bit more lot of people you see in moses days they didn't believe him you know so many people wanted to stone him <laughs> they sent the spies to spy the land they came back god said i've given you the land just go and see and come just go see what it's like bring all the pomegranates grapes and everything go see they came back and out of the 12 that went 10 gave a bad report evil report it says not just a bad report they gave an evil report what was so evil about it? The evil thing about it is they kept talking about how tall those men were in those places. How there are giants in the land. How we can't do it. It's not possible. We can't have it. We will be defeated. They'll eat us alive. We are like grasshoppers. They are giants. We are grasshoppers in their eyes. How do you know what you are in their eyes? That means you've gone berserk. Unbelief has reached its peak then. When you talk about what another man thinks. Have you heard people think about it? I think he thinks about me like this. I said, how do you know what he thinks? I think so, brother. That's what he thinks. I know very well. Well, if you want to believe that, then nobody's going to stop you from believing that, you know. They said, oh, in their eyes, we look like grasshoppers. But God said, I've given you the land. This is yours. I just want to go and get a foretaste of it and come and tell the people so that they'll be glad to go and take it. This is yours. No matter how big the giants are, how big the wall is, don't worry about it. I have given it to you. It's going to be yours. But they didn't believe it. And did you know that the whole generation perished except there was two people, Joshua and Caleb, and they wanted to stone those guys. When those guys said, hey guys, please calm down, be quiet, don't create an uproar, don't create unbelief, ten guys, you know, just calm down. Look at the pomegranates, look at the grapes, look at what we brought from there, look at that. It's truly a land flowing with milk and honey. Let's keep our mind on that. Let's keep our mind on what God has said. Let's go possess it. You know what they told him? Hey, Joshua and Caleb, we live in the real world. You live in imaginary world. A lot of people say that. When they hear me preach, they say, well, brother, we come and hear your wonderful preaching and then we come back to the real world. Well, then you stay in the real world. In the real world of sickness, in the real world of lack, in the real world of want, in the real world of fear, in the real world of worry. If that's the real world and that's what you want to keep, if that's what you want to cherish, if that's what you want to put in your heart, and if that's what you want to put a wall around and keep, and that's what you don't want to lose, that's why if that's what you're afraid of losing, my friend, then that's shame on that person, <laughs> you know. I wouldn't want to keep that stuff. I wouldn't want to keep that fear and that worry and that, all that junk and all that negativity. I would want to get rid of it. I want to put what God has said in my heart. Why do you want to keep that? Why do you want that? If that is the real world, then what do you call this? God is more real than the world because God created the world. God's word is more real because God's word made the world. To me, the word which says that my God shall supply all my needs is more real than an empty pocket. Because his word created everything. 
Don't tell me about the real world. The real world that I live in is the word world. This is a word world. God is a God of his word. Everything operates by the word. God created it by the word. Sustains it by the word. The word is the real world. Unless the word becomes more of a reality than the real world that you're talking about. We'll never walk in the blessings of God, my friend. Let the word become real. More real than what you call real. Don't talk about that real. That's not reality. Reality is God's word. Clap your hands, all the people, and shout, hey, unto God. Oh, clap your hands, all the people, and shout, hey, unto God. With a voice of triumph. Yeah.